And <laughs> so, um, those cute little kids just get me sidetracked. Oh yeah. Um, anyway. How many? How many else in here wore their spurs to church today? <laughs> Do you know? Megan did. That is completely allowed. It is. It certainly is. Um, so anyway, let's let's pray. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Show me what you want me to know. Show me what you want me to know. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. I will be a doer of your word. I will be a doer of your word. Not just a hearer. Not just a hearer. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, what I love about our church is we 100% come here by what is written on our shirts and the building. We come as we are. And you know, after salvation, we are cleaned up. But the devil is constantly telling us we're dirty. I'm here to tell you today the truth is, is if you know Jesus as your Savior, you're cleaned up, and he's asking you to follow him and to walk in his steps. And when you do that, no matter what's going on in your life, he will use you beyond your wildest expectations. He just will. You know, um, this goes back to something me and you was talking about a minute ago. When you get th thrown off a horse and you're a cowboy or a cowgirl, what's the first rule in the cowboy and cowgirl? All right, see, you guys already know the answer to the question. So why is that important? You do not want fear to set in. When fear sets in, the devil starts whispering and we start listening. Right? Yeah. So today is about that last song. I still believe. We're in a society right now that there are a lot of people walking away from the church. Now, one of the things I'll say about that, I don't think somebody truly believed if they've walked away. I think they thought they believed. I think they had an emotional experience. Because what I've discovered in my life, knowing a lot of Christians by this time in my life, this age in the game, I'm 64 years old now, and when I meet people that give their heart to the Lord, even if they have little problems here and there, even if they make mistakes, they still get back on the horse. They still get back up, yeah. right? I'll tell you a brief story. Years ago... Uh, when I wasn't living for the Lord, I was on a motorcycle one day, and I had this routine that I did every day. I lived off of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, 12th Street. When it goes on out, it turns into Memorial Road. And I lived on my road, and uh, I'd ride my motorcycle into work every day. I was working down here for Cornhaus on this YWCA building. And I'd go down Plainview Road to get on Highway 70 to come into town. You know where those railroad tracks are? If you hit them going 60 miles an hour, you clear about 70 feet of road before you land. That was my morning ritual. Because that was the way I was living at the time, right? And I'll never forget that morning that all of a sudden the truck driver who's sitting there with the concrete truck had their foot on the clutch. They didn't mean to, but uh, 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 it bounced right out in front of me while I'm in the air. And so I went down. What I did is in midair, I pushed the bike away from me, got positioned where I'd land on my butt and my back. And when I did, I was on my leathers, my back, and I slid until the bike hit the tire, and then I came up and hit the bike. I jumped up and yelled something I shouldn't have yelled at the person and jerked the motorcycle out from under there, 700-pound motorcycle out from under there, got back on it, and rode to work. Because you get back on. 
The only problem is I was doing it all in my own power. And so when I got to work, I get this funny thing started happening. All of a sudden, I started getting the shakes. And it was unstoppable. What do they call that? Shock. It took 15 minutes for it to set in. Now, in my own power, I could do nothing but stand there. And the guy working with me goes, dude, you need to go home. I called Michelle. We were dating at the time. I called Michelle, and she said, I'll be there in a minute to pick you up. I went home, and it was one of the first times in a long time I actually cried out to God because I'd never, I'd never been in shock before. I'd never had a situation like that. So in my own power, I was helpless. The minute I called out to God, even in my dysfunction, even in my alcoholism, even in my stupidness, I immediately calmed down, and then I realized a miracle had happened. And I thank God for it. Even though I didn't turn my life back over to him that day, that was the first of a series of events that caused the whole thing to turn and to cause 36 years of following Jesus. So I still believe. I still believe because I've experienced God. I still believe because I know who he is. I still believe because his word is true. Okay? So I still believe. And this message this morning is going to be about that and how do we keep moving forward in our belief. Let me tell you something that happened. I'm just going to give you a brief story and I won't go into details just in case the person I got to be with in this situation is watching. <laughs> but Michelle and I went to the beach this week. And you go, wow, you don't look like a beach guy. I'm not really a beach guy. Michelle, however, is. And Michelle told me a month ago, I need to go to the beach. I said, I don't know how we're going to get time. I said, what one do you want to go to? Because usually that's Galveston, right? That's, that's what we do. It's the closest one, or it looks the closest. There's actually one closer. And I'm going to tell you about it. Its name is Holly Beach. It is 20 miles inside of Louisiana, outside of Port Arthur. And it, what's really cool about it is it's about 2,000 yards long, and that's it. There's a gas offloading facility down here, refinery, that actually collects gas from out from under the swamps and brings it in from out at the oil rigs that are floating out in the Gulf, right? And so this beach sits in between four or five massive offshore oil rigs. And you go, that's where you went? Yeah, you can really only see them at night when they're lit up like Christmas trees, and then you just think it's like lights from a cabana, right? And you go, why'd you go there? Because six years ago, we stumbled across this place, and we thought we'd go back to visit and spend some money there because they've been hit by four hurricanes in 15 years. And when we went six years ago, it was a 100, 100 house area, and there were 10 houses left. And one guy had built his back. Well, that one guy ended up buying half of that area, and now there's like 50 homes there, all because of him. He grew up going to that beach and he didn't want it to die. So he kept buying up and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. And so we stayed in this little RV park that he had spent some money on. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. But on my way down there, I said, Father, I know it's vacation. Father, I know that I can just lay back, be on the beach or sit in a camper or do whatever I want to do while Michelle's really enjoying the beach, which she did. And, of course, she wanted me to be with her from time to time, and that was fine. But I said, Father, I want you to use me this week, whatever that looks like. We know more than get there and pull into our spot. The people next door to us welcome us. Hey, good to see you. Where are you from? Oklahoma. Oklahoma? You came all the way to Oklahoma to a beach in Louisiana? <laughs> That's a word you come from, Central Texas. Well, why'd you come here in the middle of Louisiana? 
Well, because I was tired of going to Padre. Okay. Come to find out, we had some things in common. Very interesting. Every night, I would say, Father, I pray for this family next to us. I know they got something on going on, and I just pray that you will help us to help them. We're on vacation. Why am I praying a prayer like that? Because I still believe. Yes. I, don't, I don't take the day off from God. Amen. And I don't mean as a preacher or a pastor. I mean as a Christian. I don't take the day off from God. He never takes it off with me. And so, the final night before we leave, they're leaving the next morning, we're leaving the next morning. Four beers in, this guy kind of corners me. And he says, I know you're a preacher. I said, well, how do you know that? My mom told me. Well, I forgot. His mom and I had a conversation the day before. I said, well, I'm really not a preacher. I'm a proclaimer of the gospel who loves Jesus. And I'm really more of a pastor. I'm more of a kind of guy that'll get down in the ditch with you. And he goes, sounds like my kind of guy. And he says, you mind if I have another beer? I said, no, because I know then you'll get real with me. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Am, I, am I talking the right crowd? Because I know things are fixing to get real. Come to find out, he told me some things about his life that he couldn't talk to anybody about because he does a job that nobody wants to do and he sees ugly things every day and he's been doing it for nine years. And he says, I don't even... A psychiatrist friend of mine said, just come and talk to me. He says, if I start telling you the things that have happened to me, you'll quit being my friend. I said, well, you don't have to worry about that with me. And so for the next hour, he unloaded. And I was with him. I loved him right where I was at. I didn't judge him. And then I pointed him to God, pointed him to God, pointed him to God, pointed him to God, not to me, to God, to God, to God, to God. And then I quoted a couple of scriptures in gym language. <laughs> and he went, I know those to be true. I'd gotten saved when I was about 25. But I've never done anything with it. I said, so why do you think all of this happened, this conversation between me and you? He said, because my wife's telling me I need to talk to God more. I said, your wife is a genius. <laughs> I said, the whole reason that you've had such a hard time with all of these things, you're not talking to the one who can do something about it. Amen. I want you to see that I don't believe because it's convenient. I don't believe because I'm in the mood. I don't believe because I'm in a low place and it's the only thing I can do is reach up. I believe because this book is true. The God of the universe that created this place in six days is real, that rested on the seventh to taught us, to teach us to rest. Nothing wrong with rest. It's actually good for you. A person in the first service said, I just, I asked him, tell me something you're thankful for. She said, I'm thankful that I learned to not do my whole list on Saturday so I could actually sleep on Saturday night. Sometimes it's that simple. We're supposed to rest, right? This guy needed some rest. He's self-medicating every night because he needs some rest, right? So I still believe, and because I believe, and because I'm excited about the Word, we're going to dive in. So I wanted to teach a psalm today. I had like seven of them that I was trying to choose from, and I couldn't, let, I couldn't 
nail it down. Which one, Father? Which one, Father? And he wouldn't answer. Sometimes when he don't answer, it's because he's waiting for you to actually listen. I was excited about his word. Nothing wrong with that, right? No. Usually when I'm excited about his word, I preach the whole thing, right? <laughs> cover to cover, right? But I said, Father, I want your words to come out this morning, so tell me what you want me to talk about. So I go to bed with like seven different psalms in my mind. One of these is it. I know one of these is it. Woke up this morning. See, normally 4 o'clock on Saturday night when I'm like that, usually 4 o'clock Saturday, actually Sunday morning, he wakes me up, bing, and says, here it is, and just lays it out. I woke up at 7 o'clock, and when I woke up, I went, Father, I got nothing. <laughs> so which one is it? And this is what he said. Why don't you listen to the Bible app today and listen to the person who's cultivating your faith? So I went, oh, good idea. So I go to the app. By the way, what day are we on? Does anybody remember? Who's still hanging in there with me? I think we're at day 200. 204, okay. But I'm actually on point. I actually, last night I caught up, right? And I want you to listen to the truth and not the lie. I don't care if you're six months behind. First time I listened to the Bible through... I got six months behind, and the devil goes, just give up. Don't worry about it. It ain't important. Just pick it up next year. So you know what I did come July? I finished from July. I finished the following year. So my first time listening through to the Bible, reading through the Bible on a Bible app, it took me two years. The point is you get back on the horse, and you keep riding, yeah. right? Okay, so I went over to the app, and the verse of the day was John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I went, oh my gosh, Father, only you would know that's my favorite verse of the Bible. Is that my favorite verse of the Bible? Any of you that know me are going, eh, that's like your 17th favorite verse of the Bible, right? <laughs> Anyway, it, but it, it truly is my favorite verse of the Bible. He told me to listen to that. So he spoke to me this morning about the sermon. And so I read it, and I'm listening to it, and I'm just like, oh, that goes right into Psalm 148. What did he do? He revealed which psalm to teach through what he told me this morning through another scripture. See how God works? Is he keeping me engaged? He's the ultimate teacher. Right? So, watch this. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. I'm going to stop for a second. Now, John, very unique. John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, knew how to reach the world with this gospel. And you go, okay, he wrote the book. No, he wrote it in Greek, he wrote it in Hebrew, and he wrote it in Aramaic. Aramaic was the common language. It's kind of like English in America. English is our common language, and then you get to different states and it sounds different. Sometimes it don't sound nothing like. How many have ever been to Maine? Uh, are they speaking English up there? I, there's hints of it, right? Or what about South Mississippi? Huh? Can I? Okay. So anyway, Aramaic was like that. Hebrew's Hebrew. Greek, however, is totally different than Hebrew. And there's a word in there. And when John was writing this in Greek, the word for word is logos. Now, why is it important to understand that? Because in Greek society, especially those who...
who would go to Mars Hill, or it's also called the Areopagus, is where they shared new thoughts, new ideas, they shared philosophy, and they shared what they call the logos, the words that come from our voice to represent what we're thinking. John uses that word for a word right here. Now, why is that important? He's using logos as the word, not a word, because Jesus is the word. Jesus is the truth. He is the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. It's the truth. So he takes the Greek form of this word and says, by the way, this is a word you use every day when you're talking about philosophies and higher thinking. By the way, let me clear that up for you. It means the one and only true God. Not multiple gods. It means the one. So now let's read that again. In the beginning, the word, the only one. See it? The one and true one already existed. The word, the one and only one, the one who has always existed, the one who is the truth, was with God. And the word, the only one, the true one, you see what I'm getting at? Was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. If I've learned anything in my life, and I've had at least four times that I've cried out the name of Jesus because of the pit of despair I was in or the horrible circumstance that I had created that got me in that very thing. And I cried out to him. And every time without fail, when I said, I need you, Jesus, it's like the archangel Michael himself showed up in the room, sword drawn, holding back the enemy. And you go, well, I didn't feel that. Well, you're obviously still not in the same pit. Something happened. Was it just by happenstance that something happened? No, you cried out in the name of the Word. And when you cry out in the name of the Word, things happen. Sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it happens a few days. But it always happens. Okay? Now, the creation there is no such thing as evolution there is such a thing as adaptation can I get an amen there's a lot of adaptation but there is no evolution and I like to say it like this the way John Lennon said it evolution it's evil in its thought because it pushes God aside see what I'm saying but what there is is creation and are you living in it, or are you living in spite of it? That's what it boils down to. So, turn to Psalm 146, and you go, I thought you were going to read Psalm 148. Well, I was tricking you. <laughs> no, it's that. The last five psalms in the Bible are all start and end with praise the Lord. Or Alleluia, if you have that particular um, translation. What I like about the word uh, Alleluia is I did a new study on it recently, and I loved what this author said. Alleluia means praise the Lord. This guy t breaks it down in Hebrew even deeper, and he says actually what Alleluia means is you. You. Praise the Lord. Hey, do I have your attention? You praise the Lord. Have you ever thought of that? So when you sing a song with Alleluia in it now, what is it saying? You praise the Lord. Do, do I have your attention? 
you need to praise the Lord, right? And the reason he said that is because the priest would say, sing hallelujah. It wasn't a suggestion. The priest was telling the children of Israel to do it. Okay? So it's emphatic. Now, so the last five say praise the Lord. They end with praise the Lord. And I want to show you something on Psalms that's very interesting. Psalms is very interesting in that it is a collection of five books. And this was done somewhere about, they think, about three centuries before Jesus came. That a priest is probably somebody like Hezekiah, who was king, uh, who was a great man of God. It might have been Josiah. But one of those great kings actually caused the scribes to actually put these into five books because they deal with five different things. And they end with praising the Lord and all this stuff. Now think about this. The first four books deal with our problem and the solution, our problem and the solution, our problem and the solution, our problem and the solution. And the fifth book, which these five are in, deal with the answer, the answer, the answer, the answer. In fact, the culmination of the answer. Isn't that ironic? The first 50 books in Isaiah deal with the problem and the answer, the problem and the answer, the problem and the answer. And then 53 comes along and Jesus shows up as the Messiah. And then everything else points towards the final culmination of the praise of the Lord's. The Bible itself, by the way, it has 66 books. Isn't that ironic that there's a book in the Bible that has 66 chapters in it? And there's 66 books in the Bible. And they start out with the problem, the answer, the problem, the answer, the problem, the answer, and they end with, in Revelation, the answer. And they end with the last three chapters of praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's, it's no coincidence. This was done before Revelation was even a blip on the radar. Okay? It makes you feel like you mean... God orchestrated the book? Yeah. Okay? Why do I still believe? The more I find out about the Bible, the more I find out about this God I worship, the more I can't not believe. Amen. Now watch this. So 146 is like the Bible after creation. So we read John 1, 1 through 5. That's creation or before creation and then creation. 146 is like our lives living here. And 148 is what's going to happen in the end. Ready? 146. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. What part of that do we not understand? I have people ask me all the time who are carpenter friends of mine. I've been a carpenter for 42 years. I've been a carpenter, a carpenter in this town for 40 years. And I have these friends ask me from time to time, are you still doing that preaching thing? And I'm like, what part of being called by God to do something says there's retirement in it, number one? Number two, what part of Christianity says I'm only going to do it part of my life? And what part of following God says, oh, I'm not going to follow God anymore? Now, we may have months, days, years that we don't do it to the ability that we should. But if Jesus and his spirit is alive and breathing in you, you can't stay away from it forever. <laughs> let, me let me warn you. You won't stay away from it forever. Because God, if he's given you the Holy Spirit, and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'm talking about you know his presence is in you. His presence is not there for no reason. His presence is there to glorify the Father and to point you more in a direction of God. 
How could I pray the prayer that I did on the way to a vacation? I thought on vacations you check out from everything. How do you check out from God? Everything that I experience in any given day has his name on it. The sun rises because he told it to. The sun sets because he told it to. The moon rises because he told it to. The moon sets because he told it to. The ocean only goes so far because he told it to. The land only goes so far because he told it to. The killer whales eat great white shark's liver. I'm not sure, but he must have told them to. You get what I'm saying? What happens that's not because God didn't tell it to? And even though we have free will and that free will affects other people, God is still trying to call us out on our free will constantly. Can I get an amen? When's the last time God called you out on your free will? <laughs> I think it was about two hours ago. Yeah. Fifteen minutes ago when I said, I'm a little tired, I think I want to go home. And he's going, wait, I got something you need to hear. All right. So watch this. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth and all their plans die with them. What do we know about kings and rulers and presidents? The minute that the office changes, everything else changes. You can guarantee that. Most presidencies here lately, it seems like the first two years, they try to undo the last two years of what the last president did. He made, no, no, but joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. How many promises does he keep forever? Okay. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. Now, what makes you godly? Your actions? No. His actions. The Word's action. Jesus made flesh. His actions are what makes you godly. All we do is accept it. Let's get that cleared up right off the bat. You cannot work your way to God. The way it happens is, is God calls you, he woos you, you hear him, you can't deny it, you finally say, I give up, I want you, he comes and fills you, and then now you are godly. Even on your worst day, you are godly. If you know Jesus as your Savior, on your worst day, you are still godly. The enemy is the one who says, Ah, you screwed up today. <laughs> oh, he ain't going to like that. In fact, he'll turn his back on you tomorrow. Really? I thought it says God chastens those he loves. That's a big word for meaning spank or put in a corner. Huh? Yeah. I've been put in the corner a lot by God. I can say, honestly, he spanked me a few times, too. Yeah. And it hurt. Yeah. But you know what? I learned from it. The reason I'm sitting here is because I got a licking, but I keep on ticking. <laughs> All right. Watch this. Verse 9, the Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. How many generations? Throughout the generations. All of them. Praise the Lord. Now, 
148. I feel like what's funny is, is this morning, I feel like God is a consolation prize for just doing the sermon the way he said to do it. He's letting me do 148. <laughs> Have you ever thought about it like that? He still gives you desires of your heart. But he waits until you begin to line up more with him so that the desires of your heart are actually good for you. Huh? The desire of my heart when I was on that motorcycle sliding under that truck was to get even. What would have happened if I'd have jumped into there and got even? I might be visiting you from prison right now. And that might not be so good. Is that always the best thing? No. There's always a better way with God. And we don't know what that looks like. But if we line up with him, he makes all things a that tries to destroy it. You go, but what about fire? No, wait a second. Aren't there certain trees that only grow when the fire releases its seed? Don't you get new grass and the weeds die out when you burn? Why do farmers burn their fields? It brings new life and it acts as fertilizer. There's so many things going on with fire. Don't get mad at fire. Now, if it burns you, I, got, I understand why I get, we get mad at fire. But we couldn't do anything without fire. Right? I mean, so the reality is all creation is always recreating, except for us. But if we're in the Lord, we're recreating too. Right? I just love... Psalm 148, because it's a picture of creation actually talking back to God. And you know, of all the creations that have ever been created, you're the one who has its own self-will to actually do it or not do it. Why do we get prideful in the fact that we don't have to do it? Why don't we humble ourselves and do it? Why don't we praise the Lord for everything he's doing every day on some level? As I told you, one of the things that I have got in a pattern of doing in the last three years, ever since, actually three and a half years, ever since that surgery and the last chemo I did, I, and God had these birds singing to me all the time, I don't know if I've, some of you don't know this story, but I had this bird show up during that last chemo, and Michelle would open the windows and doors, and I could hear it. And we looked it up, and it's called Swainson's Thrush. You know, I've nicknamed that bird. You know what I call it? Jimmy's Thrush. Because I'd never heard that bird before. If you ever look that up and you listen to its call, I want you to notice every movie that has to do with nature that comes out of Hollywood uses that bird in its sound. The Foley artist uses it in all outdoor movies because it is so distinct. That bird showed up in my backyard singing every day. And I finally nicknamed it Jimmy's Thrush. And from that day forward, I would thank God every time I'd hear that bird, no matter how bad I felt. That actually taught me to thank God every morning for whatever. And you know what propels me to still believe? Is that I thank God for everything. And when we can thank God for everything, we are truly walking with God. I want you to be thinking about that as we go into this time of reflection. I want you to be thinking about something. I know some of you are in awful positions right now. I want you to be thinking about something that you can praise the Lord for, that you can turn around and thank God for today. And what you will discover is you can thank God right out of the situation you're in. Because more that we thank God and the more we praise the Lord, 
He brings us up and out of the problem. Whether we're physically out of it or not, it doesn't matter. Mentally and emotionally, we come right out of the mud.